Well, good morning and holy greetings to brothers and sisters, and God bless you. This is Scott Bradley, and this is the Rivers of Life Inspirational Broadcast. We're grateful for you that have tuned us into this day, a day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing and glad in it. God bless every one of you. I'm asking invite you to come on in and hear a word from the Lord today. The Lord has moved upon us and given us a word, and we want to share it with you that are viewing. I want to encourage you to please hit the share button, as we oftentimes ask you to do. Let other people know that we're on, whether they be near, whether they be far. Also, let us know where you are viewing from. If you are viewing us here in these United States, please let us know. If you are viewing us in other parts of the world, such as India, Pakistan, Africa, where we oftentimes hear from, please chime in and let us know where you are viewing from. God bless each and every one of you. We thank God for what he's doing today. Please visit our website, scottbradleyministries.com. That's just one word, no gaps in between, scottbradleyministries.com. And, of course, those of you that are in the Chicago area, we'd like to encourage you to view our church, where yours truly is the pastor, uh, the New Morgan Park Church of God in Christ, which is located at 1101 West 111th Place in the city of Chicago, right on the corner of 111th Place in Aberdeen. Our Sunday services start at 1130 a.m. God bless you. Come on in and let's hear a word from the Lord. Praise be the name of the Lord. God bless. All right. Uh, we have a word that I want to share with you today. I want to go right to the word today. You know, I'm actually, uh, these next uh, several uh, broadcasts we're doing, we're going to be doing an uh, experiment. Nothing that you're going to be aware of, but I'm, I'm trying to keep it within a certain time because we are considering going with another network in, 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 in uh, addition to these that we're on, Facebook, YouTube, and another network, and they've informed us that, that we have to be within a certain time frame. I usually, with these, usually go of usually about 32, 33 minutes, but we got to cut that down by four minutes. So we're not going to give a lot of preliminaries. We're going to go right to the word of the Lord today. But this is something that has been laid upon my heart. I was going through some things last night. I've been meditating on it this morning. Concerning we that profess to be Christians. Now, let me say this before I read the word today. Uh, there is a... A difference. Let me say this. The, the, the Christian is the religious title. Uh, I sometimes use that. I, I don't necessarily hold to that because I like to think that my relationship, my walk with God is deeper than just religion. Religion is duty. Relationship is an intimacy. There's, there's a greater difference. You know, you have, to give you an example of this, you have the institution of marriage but then you have the intimacy and the relationship within marriage. Uh, oftentimes, uh, people lose the intimacy. Oh, we're married. We've been married a long time. But they, they no longer have the, the, the intimacy that goes with it, the relationship that goes with it, the lovemaking that goes with it, the friendship that goes with it, the laughter that goes with it, all of the things that should make up a marriage because, after all, according to the Bible, marriage is a lifelong commitment. Uh, the same, I think, goes in our walk with God. You've got the religion. You've got the institution. People call themselves Christians. But all of the previous names, the intimacy, the friendship, the communication that goes within the relationship is no longer there. And unfortunately, it's causing many people to stray away. And we really don't know the Lord. Uh, that's a, a bad thing that, that, that we're experiencing nowadays. But listen, uh, I want to encourage us to walk closer to the Lord. You know, because the world's concept of religion uh, is way off. The world's concept, I should say, of Christianity, walking with Jesus is way off. Uh, that's why people buy into other things, because they have not really known the Lord. Uh, I'm looking at a commercial that I'm seeing nowadays, uh, and, 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 and to be very honest with you, it's the world's definition of who Jesus is, or it's a Jesus that they have created, which is not a Jesus of the Bible. Now, again, I'm saying that. I'm putting it out there. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not apologizing for what I'm saying. Uh, in fact, I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, he gets us. Jesus gets us. And they show these little uh, these, uh, montage of people doing various things, in the various things. Uh, most of the things they're showing are uh, actions that people take. Again, there, there, there's some good concepts, poor, down and out, uh, you know, that kind of thing. 
but uh, I think it's also being used to justify wrong, you know, lifestyles, uh, you know, things that people do. Uh, and, and saying that Jesus gets us uh, is, is basically trying to justify that from, from my concept of what I'm seeing with these little, these little commercials. The Bible says this, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end of are the ways of death. We have to be reminded, I think, sometimes even as Christians, those of us that are walking with God, we have to be reminded of Jesus' reason for coming. He came to save us from our sins. Not that we continue to walk in the sin, but to turn, as we're going to talk about here today. Another passage of scripture I want to quote. Apostle Paul said in the sixth chapter of Romans, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue any longer therein? In other words, we don't want to continue. After the Lord has saved us, after we've given ourselves to him, after we've repented and accepted him as Lord and Savior, we now want to walk of following his paths and his statutes. We no longer want to walk in the ways of sin with the idea, well, grace will abound. No, no, God forbid, Paul says. How should we that are dead to sin continue any longer therein? And I'm afraid what has happened is that people have not really experienced a full conversion and hence caused them to turn away from their sin. You've heard me say this quite often. When Jesus becomes Lord, and we have, uh, have the attitude of servant. The motive of the servant is to fulfill the will and do the will of his Lord. Uh, this morning, I want to read from Romans, the 12th chapter, and starting at verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Again, this is what you do with your body. Make your body a living sacrifice. Present it holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, again, to think about that, present yourself holy. Uh, being a fornicator or adulterer is not holy. Being a homosexual, a practicing homosexual is not holy. Uh, being a habitual liar, uh, being into all types of ungodly things, ungodly actions, doing ungodly things, is not presenting yourself holy. Be, present yourself holy. And Paul says, this is your reasonable service. In other words, it's the least you can do for what God has done for you to present yourself holy. Now, you're a living sacrifice. And understanding what a sacrifice is, before this time, of course, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, uh, sacrifices, animals were presented on the altar, slain and killed on the altar, uh, as a sacrifice, the shedding of the blood of the innocent lamb was for the purpose of covering the sin, the innocent dying for all of us that are guilty. Christ has become that ultimate sacrifice. He sacrificed himself. He died as an innocent man for all of us that are guilty. Now, we that are following him now become living sacrifice. In other words, we are not killed per se. Uh, and, and I'm going to deal with that a little bit further. But we now uh, present ourselves on the altar as a living sacrifice. And what does that mean? We sacrifice ourselves and give over to his will. Holy, acceptable, which is the reasonable service of those of us that are living sacrifices. And then verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world. In other words, we can no longer walk in the stature and the ways of the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, transformation taking place in the mind. Because when the mind is transformed, the rest of everything falls in line. We, we, we walk right, we live right, we live holy because we have been transformed by the renewing of our mind. I want to deal on that subject today, living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Praise the Lord. But notice where this takes place. It takes place on the altar. On the altar. What was the altar usually for? Well, the altar was a place of worship. I mean, again, br by bringing this sacrifice, uh, the altar was where uh, people brought the sacrifice for their sins. It was part of worship. 
uh, the altar. Sometimes it's even where people give their gifts. Now, in biblical days, they gave their gifts of uh, you know animal sacrifices. Uh, and it can be said, even in this 21st century, that uh, when we bring our uh, tithes and offerings, uh, that is a sacrifice that's, that's brought uh, to the altar. Uh, and again, the altar is the place of sacrifice. Uh, it is also an area of consecration. Consecration. When one is consecrated, he becomes separated. He becomes concentrated, separated. A place of reference. Consecration is a time of reference, a time of worship, a time of sacredness and holiness, part of consecration. Uh, and so when we're looking at the altar, the altar is the physical altar, but then we become living sacrifices on the altar in our spirit. We become sacrifice of altar in the presence of God. We are still living, but our life is a life of sacrifice. Now, unfortunately, this is the message that oftentimes is not heard in this day and time, particularly in this day and time of prosperity and well-being and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, just wealth and all that kind of thing. And we're not really thinking sacrificial. Uh, we're thinking uh, wealth and greed. We think of concepts on how we can get rich and, and uh, make the Lord a partner. Now, I hear things uh, that I think are quite strange and, and at the same time quite disturbing. Uh, I heard a preacher say this the other day that uh, he uh, wants to give to the point where God owes him because, again, he's giving more, evidently more than this 10% or more than whatever. And so because of that, God is in debt to him. Well, I think that's a bad concept. I don't think that's a, a good concept to think that God owes you. Because the reality is, brothers and sisters, the Lord has already done more for us than we could ever pay him back for. If the Lord would have put a price tag on what he has done for us already, we'd never be able to pay him back. That's why I say that I'm indebted to praise God throughout eternity, not just the rest of my life, and I certainly am indebted to praise him the rest of my life, but even after I pass out of time into eternity because of what he has done, I'm saved by his grace, I'm saved by his love, I'm saved by his mercy, and the very fact that I get to be with him throughout eternity, I feel indebted to praise and magnify him throughout eternity. And even in this world, when I go through trials and tests and tribulations and fatigue and the other things that may plague me, still I'm indebted to praise God. Not because of how I feel, not because of my status, not because of my state of mind, not because of my state of wealth or the lack thereof. I'm indebted to praise him because of what he has already done for me. I'm indebted, I'm indebted to do that. And therefore, as a living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, I should be holy. I should be holy. And so why? I'm holy because he is holy. Now, if I stumble, if I fail, if I fall, thank God that his mercy endureth forever. And the Bible said, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The Bible said, if we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So therefore, even if I fail, and that's not to say that I'm out willingly sinning, but sometimes fail, sometimes stumble, sometimes mess up. You know, and uh, I don't like to use that term, you know, mistake. I, I, I think that that's not really the term of when we mess up, because in many cases we know full well what we're doing. But notice, a living sacrifice. Apostle Paul said this in Galatians uh, 2 and 20, I am crucified with Christ. Crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Again, that's Galatians 2.20. So what is he saying? He's saying that I'm living even though I'm crucified every day. So the things that I confront every day, the, the trials and the tests that I confront every day are part of my crucifixion. I'm crucified with Christ because my life, again, he says in uh, Galatians 3 and 3, your life is hid with Christ. My life is hid with Christ. So what Christ suffered I suffer, again, because of what he has done. His death allows me to live. His sacrifice allows me to sacrifice, but I'm a living sacrifice. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. And then notice what y'all further says. Be not conformed to this world. If I'm going to be a living sacrifice, I cannot be conformed to the ways and the attitudes and the statutes of this world. 
Uh, one passage of scripture I'm quoting in uh, my mind, uh, we are in the world, but we are not of the world, I think is, is how it goes. In other words, uh, we are in this world, we are in this system, but we are not of the system. We have a higher call. Uh, and that's why, brothers and sisters, oftentimes what brings conflict between those of us that are really following the Lord, those of us that have been born again, those of us that have made Jesus Christ our Lord, there is conflict between our standards and the world's standards. Uh, the world uh, thinks it's all right to cheat. The world thinks it's all right to lie. The world thinks it's all right to uh, have extramarital affairs. The world uh, has no problem with this. Well, we that are walking with God have a big problem with it. The world thinks it's no long, uh, no no problem to to live life, you know, any way you want. Uh, you know, it reminds me it reminds me years ago when I was in the Marine Corps and uh, we were out in a, in a, uh, a bivouac, which is you know, an outdoor. It's actually a, a war game. Uh, and, and we were out in the Mojave Desert uh, in these war games. And, of course, the last day had come, actually two weeks out there. And as we had come to, toward the end, there was a big party, uh, pizza and beer. Uh, well, I ate the pizza, but I wasn't going to drink the beer uh, because I don't believe that sanctified people ought to indulge in that. That's just my concept. Some of y'all have a different concept. I ain't going to fool with you, mess with you. But that's my conviction. I don't believe in smoking, drinking, and getting high, taking drugs. I don't. I don't. I believe as a sanctified minister of the gospel, and never mind minister of the gospel, just as a sanctified person, as a follower of Christ, Christians don't indulge in those things. That's my faith, that's my conviction, and I'm holding to it, which again brings offense to the world. And some of you that profess to be Christians that indulge in some of those things, you may be offended by what, is, what I'm saying as well. Nonetheless, uh, there was a, a fella at the, at the end of the, the, the uh, two-week training, uh, and, and uh, you know, again, pizza and beer, and uh, some of the guys were getting drunk, of course, because they had too much beer and ration to the pizza. And uh, one guy, I was talking to him, and he was drunk, holding a bottle of beer in his hand. And I was talking to him about the Lord. And uh, he just kept saying, well, God understands because we're human. He understands. Well, you know, that basically is a justification to say God understands. Of course, the Lord understands. But that does not justify what you fail to understand, sir, ma'am, is that when you sin, you need to repent for your sin. You don't continue in sin, as Paul said, that grace may abound. Well, again, people are oftentimes using ways to justify their failure. Explanation. Uh, an explanation to God is not repentance. You know, uh, you, know you, you, you uh uh, do the wrong thing, and you come before God, instead of repenting and saying, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I've done the wrong thing, Lord, forgive me, you start explaining to God why you messed up and start blaming other people, her fault, his fault, if they hadn't done this, I wouldn't do that, they made me do this, I was doing fine until she came along and blah, blah, blah. That's not a repentance. That's an explanation. An explanation does not give you deliverance. An explanation does not save you. An explanation does not get you justification because an explanation basically is self-justification you're trying to justify your failure you're trying to justify your sin by explaining to god why you messed up that is not repentance repentance brothers and sisters is being sorry for your sin with the mind to turn from it and not to do it again that's what repentance is not repenting because you got caught Which oftentimes see happen. People repent. You know, if they never got caught, they'd keep doing the same thing. But repentance is turning from your sin. And even if you struggle with it, you know, brothers and sisters, I think we'd be honest with ourselves. A lot of us have, have struggles, you know. Um, and, go, and most of the struggles are sins of the flesh. Uh, you know, uh, sexual immorality, uh, um, eating, overeating, talking too much, you know, sins of the flesh. Uh how do we get rid of these things? How do we turn from these things? Well, number one, if you're really repentant, you don't want to put yourself back in the same environment that caused you to mess up in the first place. You know, I've known of people that genuinely get delivered. I mean, I mean, they, they, oh, they cry. They, 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 they're repentant. They're on the altar. They're, they're waiting before, they're, they're, they're genuinely repentant. Now, some of y'all have a problem. With not, I mean, ain't no way in the Bible people get slain in the spirit. I know that's a concept that we use. But if I can use that concept, I've seen people fall out on the altar. And I mean with tears of repentance. I mean the Lord has delivered them. And when they get up, they look like a different person. 
They get done. They look like a different person. They have truly been delivered. God has squeezed out their spirit and all those things that were in their spirit and attached themselves to them. God has delivered them. But this is what the Bible says. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, it seeketh rest. And when it findeth none, he goes back to where it came from. That spirit that you've been delivered from will come back. And when he sees the house swept and garnished, he says, I will take with me seven other spirits, and those spirits are worse than him. And they go back into the person. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Here's the problem that happens. People get delivered, but they don't stay in the environment that they were delivered from. If you are delivered at the altar, you need to stay at the altar. I'm talking about the altar of your mind, the altar of your spirit, uh, with praying and fasting and sacrificing and making yourself a living sacrifice. But this is what I see happen a lot of times. People get delivered, but go right back to the environment that they came from in a matter of weeks, they're right back in the state that they were before because that unclean spirit comes back. Now, you know, people used to often say every time you backslide, get, you get seven demons. That's not what that means. You know, it simply means that you do not maintain deliverance. Don't come to church, get delivered, and then don't come to church anymore because you are no longer in the environment that would keep you delivered. You need to be where there is praying. You need to be where there is praising and worship. You need to be where the word of God is going forth, not where the church is just a social club and a fashion show. If that's all your church is, you don't need to be there because you cannot maintain deliverance. You need to learn how to keep your body a living sacrifice and a transformation of mind. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So again, uh, we are a living sacrifice. And Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I'm living, uh, the, 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 the life that I live, I've lived with the concept of Christ living in me. He has become my Lord. He has become my master. He has become my king. Therefore, I follow his ways. Otherwise, you set yourself up being vulnerable to attack again of demonic forces. And understand, brothers and sisters, they will come back. They will come back. And if you're in the same environment, if you're hanging out at the club, you know, with your same old friends, talking crazy, acting crazy, doing stupid, crazy stuff, you've just opened yourself up. And the Bible said when the devil comes back, he sees, hey, this guy is all swept in garments. He's all cleaned out. Hey, buddies, come on. He gets seven more spirits. We can have a party in this guy. And the Bible said the last state of the man is worse than the first. But you must present yourself. And I hope you all are getting this. Present yourself a living sacrifice. Hallelujah. All right, let's move on here. When we talk about the altar, the altar is salvation. Your salvation is at the altar. Your, 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 your uh, repentance is at the altar. Uh, uh, what is that song, if I can remember the words of it? Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou and thine atonement did give thyself for me. I owe no other master, but my heart shall be the throne. Let me stay on the altar, and you reign on the throne. Uh, so again, the heart has become the throne. Jesus is on the throne. He sits in my heart. And my heart is the throne. My heart shall be a my heart shall be a throne. Let me stay on the altar, and you reign on the throne. Christ on the throne of my heart. Where am I on the altar? Why am I on the altar? Because I need to stay as a sacrifice. Where is the sacrifice placed? On the altar. I'm not dead. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Where? In my heart. My heart is the throne, you know, according to the song. And so, therefore, that's where he is. And where am I? On the altar. So, again, the altar, the place of deliverance, the place of sacrifice. Uh, the altar is where transformation takes place. Notice what the Bible said in Galatians 6.15. If any man be in Christ, that's the concept, in Christ, not not you know, religion, but be intimacy in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things become new. Why? Because my body is on the altar and the old things are sacrificed. The old things are crucified. Now, you know, brothers and sisters, this is a process. 
Be very honest. It's a process. They don't always happen overnight. It's a process. But it, it, the process takes place by remaining on the altar. You know, I sometimes hear people uh, say things, and uh, they're, they're some, somewhat amusing, I guess, for lack of a better word. Then again, maybe they're not amusing at all. But I've known people that will tell you, say, man, look, don't push me. I lay down my religion. Well, <laughs> that's easy to do. But when you know Christ, it's a whole different thing. Sometimes you take stuff. Sometimes you swallow stuff. Sometimes you will have to turn the other cheek. Sometimes you have to take insults. See, and a, a dead man will not respond. Uh, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm on the altar. Uh, therefore, I'm basically a, 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 a dead person. You know, even though I'm, I'm living, and again, that's, I know that sounds contradictory, but I think you understand the gist of what I'm saying. If I'm on the altar, if I'm crucified with Christ, if I'm hid in Christ, people can insult me. Uh, I told you all before, one time I was confronted by a little fellow that began to cuss me out and, and, and threatening toward me. And I was ready to, to defend myself. And the Holy Ghost told me to shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I heard the Holy Ghost say that. Well, again, let me move on because I see my time is, is running here. But again, the, the, there's, there's changing on the altar. We become a new creature. On the altar, there is remission. The release. What does remission mean? The release from guilt. Hallelujah. That makes me glad. The release from guilt. Where does that take place? On the altar. While I'm presenting myself on the altar, a living sacrifice, there's a remission from guilt. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission from sin. So again, the shedding of the blood that took place, Christ shed his blood, and therefore on the altar as a living sacrifice, I now become the recipient of the release of guilt, recipient of remission or the release from guilt guilt. Praise the Lord. Some of us I want to read here as our time is, is about to uh, expire here. Praise the Lord. We're, 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 we're running, running good here. Thank the Lord. But uh, we, we need to uh, thank God. Get ready to close out here. Praise the Lord. Thank God for his goodness and his grace. Amen. Uh, I want to read from, uh, um, uh, let's see, where was that? Uh, 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 9 and 13. Time is up here. Uh, Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Praise Lord. So when we are on the altar, living sacrifice, we are partakers of the altar. Again, the altar, the place of salvation, the place of change, the place of remission. That's where we are when we are on the altar. Praise the Lord. All right, brothers and sisters, our time is up. Thank God. I hope you got that. Listen, I want to encourage you to visit our website, scottbradleyministries.com. We've got uh, a lot of information about ministry. We've got books and, and, and uh, CDs and things that we've written and done that are available. Uh, once again, go to that website. Thank God. You that are in the Chicago area, please visit us at the, Rivers, uh, the uh, New Morgan Park Church of God in Christ, located at 1101 West 111th Place, the city of Chicago. Our Sunday service time is 1130. Until next week, this is Scott Bradley saying God bless you. We love you and thank God for you. We'll talk to you again real soon. God bless.